introductory note of on friendship and on old age this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales on friendship and on old age by marcus tullius cicero translated by e s schuckberg introductory note marcus tullius cicero the greatest of roman orators and the chief master of latin prose style was born at arpinum january three one o six b c his father who was a man of property and belonged to the class of the knights moved to rome when cicero was a child and the future statesman received an elaborate education in rhetoric law and philosophy studying and practicing under some of the most noted teachers of the time he began his career as an advocate at the age of twenty-five and almost immediately came to be recognized not only as a man of brilliant talents but also as a courageous upholder of justice in the face of grave political danger after two years of practice he left rome to travel in greece and asia taking all the opportunities that offered to study his art under distinguished masters he returned to Rome greatly improved in health and in professional skill, and in 76 BC was elected to the office of Quaestor. He was assigned to the province of Lilibarum in Sicily, and the vigor and justice of his administration earned him the gratitude of the inhabitants. It was at their request that he undertook in 70 BC the prosecution of Veres, who as praetor had subjected the Sicilians to incredible extortion and oppression, and his successful conduct of this case, which ended in the conviction and banishment of Veres, may be said to have launched him on his political career. He became ideal in the same year, in 67 BC, praetor and in sixty four b c was elected consul by a large majority the most important event of the year of his consulship was the conspiracy of catiline this notorious criminal of patrician rank had conspired with a number of others many of them young men of high birth but dissipated character to seize the chief offices of the state and to extricate themselves from the pecuniary and other difficulties that had resulted from their excesses by the wholesale plunder of the city the plot was unmasked by the vigilance of cicero five of the traitors were summarily executed and in the overthrow of the army that had been gathered in their support catiline himself perished cicero regarded himself as the saviour of his country and his country for the moment seemed to give grateful assent but reverses were at hand during the existence of the political combination of pompey caesar and crassus known as the first triumvirate p clodius an enemy of cicero's proposed a law banishing any one who had put roman citizens to death without trial this was aimed at cicero on account of his share in the catiline affair and in march fifty eight b c he left rome the same day a law was passed by which he was banished by name and his property was plundered and destroyed a temple to liberty being erected on the site of his house in the city during his exile cicero's manliness to some extent deserted him he drifted from place to place seeking the protection of officials against assassination writing letters urging his supporters to agitate for his recall sometimes accusing them of lukewarmness and even treachery bemoaning the ingratitude of his country or regretting the course of action that had led to his outlawry and suffering from extreme depression over his separation from his wife and children and the wreck of his political ambitions finally in august fifty seven b c the decree for his restoration was passed and he returned to rome the next month being received with immense popular enthusiasm during the next few years the renewal of the understanding among the triumvirs shut cicero out from any leading part in politics and he resumed his activity in the law courts his most important case being perhaps the defence of milo for the murder of clodius cicero's most troublesome enemy 
this oration in the revised form in which it has come down to us is ranked as among the finest specimens of the art of the orator though in its original form it failed to secure milo's acquittal meantime cicero was also devoting much time to literary composition and his letters show great dejection over the political situation and a somewhat wavering attitude towards the various parties in the state in fifty five b c he went to cilicia in asia minor as proconsul an office which he administered with efficiency and integrity in civil affairs and with success in military he returned to italy in the end of the following year and he was publicly thanked by the senate for his services but disappointed in his hopes for a triumph the war for supremacy between caesar and pompey which had for some time been gradually growing more certain broke out in forty nine b c when caesar led his army across the rubicon and cicero after much irresolution threw in his lot with pompey who was overthrown the next year in the battle of pharsalus and later murdered in egypt cicero returned to italy where caesar treated him magnanimously and for some time he devoted himself to philosophical and rhetorical writing in forty six b c he divorced his wife terentia to whom he had been married for thirty years and married the young and wealthy publia in order to relieve himself from financial difficulties but her also he shortly divorced caesar who had now become supreme in rome was assassinated in forty four b c and though cicero was not a sharer in the conspiracy he seems to have approved the deed in the confusion which followed he supported the cause of the conspirators against antony and when finally the triumvirate of antony octavius and lepidus was established cicero was included among the proscribed and on december seventh forty three b c he was killed by agents of antony his head and hands were cut off and exhibited at rome the most important orations of the last months of his life were the fourteen philippics delivered against antony and the price of this enmity he paid with his life to his contemporaries cicero was primarily the great forensic and political orator of his time and the fifty-eight speeches which have come down to us bear testimony to the skill wit eloquence and passion which gave him his preeminence but these speeches of necessity deal with the minute details of the occasions which called them forth and so require for their appreciation a full knowledge of the history political and personal of the time the letters on the other hand are less elaborate both in style and in the handling of current events while they serve to reveal his personality and to throw light upon roman life in the last days of the republic in an extremely vivid fashion cicero as a man in spite of his self-importance the vacillation of his political conduct in desperate crises and the whining despondency of his times of adversity stands out as at bottom a patriotic roman of substantial honesty who gave his life to check the inevitable fall of the commonwealth to which he was devoted the evils which were undermining the republic bear so many striking resemblances to those which threaten the civic and national life of america to-day that the interest of the period is by no means merely historical as a philosopher cicero's most important function was to make his countrymen familiar with the main schools of greek thought much of his writing is thus of secondary interest to us in comparison with his originals but in the fields of religious theory and of the application of philosophy to life he made important first-hand contributions from these works have been selected the two treatises on old age and on friendship which have proved of most permanent and widespread interest to posterity and which give a clear impression of the way in which a high-minded roman thought about some of the main problems of human life End of introductory note
treatise one of on friendship and on old age by marcus tullius cicero this librivox recording is in the public domain treatise one on friendship part one the augur quintus musius scaevola used to recount a number of stories about his father-in-law galus laelius accurately remembered and charmingly told and whenever he talked about him always gave him the title of the wise without any hesitation i had been introduced by my father to scaevola as soon as i had assumed the toga virilis and i took advantage of the introduction never to quit the venerable man's side as long as i was able to stay and he was spared to us the consequence was that i committed to memory many disquisitions of his as well as many short pointed apothems and in short took as much advantage of his wisdom as i could when he died i attached myself to scaevola the pontifex whom i may venture to call quite the most distinguished of our countrymen for ability and uprightness but of this latter i shall take other occasions to speak to return to scaevola the augur among many other occasions i particularly remember one he was sitting on a semicircular garden bench as was his custom when i and a very few intimate friends were there and he chanced to turn the conversation upon a subject which about that time was in many people's mouths you must remember atticus for you were very intimate with publius sulpicius what expressions of astonishment or even indignation were called forth by his mortal quarrel as tribune with the consul quintus pompeius with whom he had formerly lived on terms of the closest intimacy and affection well on this occasion happening to mention this particular circumstance scaevola detailed to us a discourse of laelius on friendship delivered to himself and laelius's other son-in-law galus fanius son of marcus fanius a few days after the death of africanus the points of that discussion i committed to memory and have arranged them in this book at my own discretion for i have brought the speakers as it were personally on to my stage to prevent the constant said i and said he of a narrative and to give the discourse the air of being orally delivered in our hearing you have often urged me to write something on friendship and i quite acknowledged that the subject seemed one worth everybody's investigation and especially suited to the close intimacy that has existed between you and me accordingly i was quite ready to benefit the public at your request as to the dramatis personae in the treatise on old age which i dedicated to you i introduced cato as chief speaker no one i thought could with greater propriety speak on old age than one who had been an old man longer than any one else and had been exceptionally vigorous in his old age similarly having learnt from tradition that of all friendships that between gaius laelius and publius scipio was the most remarkable i thought laelius was just the person to support the chief part in a discussion on friendship which scaevola remembered him to have actually taken moreover a discussion of this sort gains somehow in weight from the authority of men of ancient days especially if they happen to have been distinguished so it comes about that in reading over what i have myself written i have a feeling at times that it is actually cato that is speaking not i finally as i sent the former essay to you as a gift from one old man to another so i have dedicated this on friendship as a most affectionate friend to his friend in the former cato spoke who was the oldest and wisest man of his day in this laelius speaks on friendship laelius who was at once a wise man that was the title given him and eminent for his famous friendship please forget me for a while imagine laelius to be speaking gaius fanius and quintus musius come to call on their father-in-law after the death of africanus they start the subject laelius answers them and the whole essay on friendship is his in reading it you will recognize a picture of yourself two fanius you are quite right laelius there never was a better or more illustrious character than africanus but you should consider that at the present moment all eyes are on you everybody calls you the wise par excellence and thinks you so 
the same mark of respect was lately paid cato and we know that in the last generation lucius attilius was called the wise but in both cases the word was applied with a certain difference attilius was so called from his reputation as a jurist cato got the name as a kind of honorary title and in extreme old age because of his varied experience of affairs and his reputation for foresight and firmness and the sagacity of the opinions which he delivered in senate and forum you however are regarded as wise in a somewhat different sense not alone on account of natural ability and character but also from your industry and learning and not in the sense in which the vulgar but that in which scholars give that title in this sense we do not read of any one being called wise in greece except one man at athens and he to be sure had been declared by the oracle of apollo also to be the supremely wise man for those who commonly go by the name of the seven sages are not admitted into the category of the wise by fastidious critics your wisdom people believe to consist in this that you look upon yourself as self-sufficing and regard the changes and chances of mortal life as powerless to affect your virtue accordingly they are always asking me and doubtless also our scevola here how you bear the death of africanus this curiosity has been the more excited from the fact that on the nones of this month when we auguries met as usual in the suburban villa of decimus brutus for consultation you were not present though it had always been your habit to keep that appointment and perform that duty with the utmost punctuality Scevola. yes indeed laelius i am often asked the question mentioned by fanius but i answer in accordance with what i have observed i say that you bear in a reasonable manner the grief which you have sustained in the death of one who was at once a man of the most illustrious character and a very dear friend that of course you could not but be affected anything else would have been wholly unnatural in a man of your gentle nature but that the cause of your non-attendance at our college meeting was illness not melancholy laelius thanks scaevola you are quite right you spoke the exact truth for in fact i had no right to allow myself to be withdrawn from a duty which i had regularly performed as long as i was well by any personal misfortune nor do i think that anything that can happen will cause a man of principle to intermit a duty as for your telling me phanius of the honourable appellation given me an appellation to which i do not recognise my title and to which i make no claim you doubtless act from feelings of affection but i must say that you seem to me to do less than justice to cato if any one was ever wise of which i have my doubts he was putting aside everything else consider how he bore his son's death i had not forgotten paulus i had seen with my own eyes gallus but they lost their sons when mere children cato his when he was a full-grown man with an assured reputation do not therefore be in a hurry to reckon as cato superior even that same famous personage whom apollo as you say declared to be the wisest remember the former's reputation rests on deeds the latter's on words three now as far as i am concerned i speak to both of you now believe me the case stands thus if i were to say that i am not affected by regret for scipio i must leave the philosophers to justify my conduct but in point of fact i should be telling a lie affected of course i am by the loss of a friend as i think there will never be again such as i can fearlessly say there never was before but i stand in no need of medicine i can find my own consolation and it consists chiefly in my being free from the mistaken notion which generally causes pain at the departure of friends to scipio i am convinced no evil has befallen mine is the disaster if disaster there be and to be severely distressed at one's own misfortunes does not show that you love your friend but that you love yourself as for him who can say that all is not more than well for unless he had taken the fancy to wish for immortality the last thing of which he ever thought what is there for which mortal man may wish that he did not attain in his early manhood he more than justified by extraordinary personal courage the hopes which his fellow-citizens had conceived of him as a child 
he never was a candidate for the consulship yet was elected consul twice the first time before the legal age the second at a time which as far as he was concerned was soon enough but was near being too late for the interests of the state by the overthrow of two cities which were the most bitter enemies of our empire he put an end not only to the wars then raging but also to the possibility of others in the future what need to mention the exquisite grace of his manners his dutiful devotion to his mother his generosity to his sisters his liberality to his relations the integrity of his conduct to every one you know all this already finally the estimation in which his fellow-citizens held him has been shown by the signs of mourning which accompanied his obsequies what could such a man have gained by the addition of a few years though age need not be a burden as i remember cato arguing in the presence of myself and scipio two years before he died yet it cannot but take away the vigour and freshness which scipio was still enjoying we may conclude therefore that his life from the good fortune which had attended him and the glory he had attained was so circumstanced that it could not be bettered while the suddenness of his death saved him the sensation of dying as to the manner of his death it is difficult to speak you see what people suspect thus much however i may say scipio in his lifetime saw many days of supreme triumph and exultation but none more magnificent than his last on which upon the rising of the senate he was escorted by the senators and the people of rome by the allies and by the latins to his own door from such an elevation of popular esteem the next step seems naturally to be an ascent to the gods above rather than a descent to hades four for i am not one of these modern philosophers who maintain that our souls perish with our bodies and that death ends all with me ancient opinion has more weight whether it be that of our own ancestors who attributed such solemn observances to the dead as they plainly would not have done if they had believed them to be wholly annihilated or that of the philosophers who once visited this country and who by their maxims and doctrines educated magna gracia which at that time was in a flourishing condition though it has now been ruined or that of the man who was declared by apollo's oracle to be the most wise and who used to teach without the variation which is to be found in most philosophers that the souls of men are divine and that when they have quitted the body a return to heaven is open to them least difficult to those who have been most virtuous and just this opinion was shared by scipio only a few days before his death as though he had a presentiment of what was coming he discoursed for three days on the state of the republic the company consisted of phyllis and manlius and several others and i had brought you scaevola along with me the last part of his discourse referred principally to the immortality of the soul for he told us what he had heard from the elder africanus in a dream now if it be true that in proportion to a man's goodness the escape from what may be called the prison and bonds of the flesh is easiest whom can we imagine to have had an easier voyage to the gods than scipio i am disposed to think therefore that in his case mourning would be a sign of envy rather than of friendship if however the truth rather is that the body and soul perish together and that no sensation remains then though there is nothing good in death at least there is nothing bad remove sensation and a man is exactly as though he had never been born and yet that this man was born is a joy to me and will be a subject of rejoicing to this state to its last hour wherefore as i said before all is as well as possible with him not so with me for as i entered life before him it would have been fairer for me to leave it also before him yet such is the pleasure i take in recalling our friendship that i look upon my life as having been a happy one because i have spent it with scipio with him i was associated in public and private business with him i lived in rome and served abroad and between us there was the most complete harmony in our tastes our pursuits and our sentiments which is the true secret of friendship 
it is not therefore in that reputation for wisdom mentioned just now by fannius especially as it happens to be groundless that i find my happiness so much as in the hope that the memory of our friendship will be lasting what makes me care the more about this is the fact that in all history there are scarcely three or four pairs of friends on record and it is classed with them that i cherish a hope of the friendship of scipio and laelius being known to posterity Fanius. of course that must be so laelius but since you have mentioned the word friendship and we are at leisure you would be doing me a great kindness and i expect scavola also if you would do as it is your habit to do when asked questions on other subjects and tell us of your sentiments about friendship its nature and the rules to be observed in regard to it scavola i shall of course be delighted fannius has anticipated the very request i was about to make so you will be doing us both a great favour five laelius i should certainly have no objection if i felt confidence in myself for the theme is a noble one and we are as fannius has said at leisure but who am i and what ability have i what you propose is all very well for professional philosophers who are used to particularly if greeks to have the subject for discussion proposed to them on the spur of the moment it is a task of considerable difficulty and requires no little practice therefore for a set discourse on friendship you must go i think to professional lecturers all i can do is to urge on you to regard friendship as the greatest thing in the world for there is nothing which so fits in with our nature or is so exactly what we want in prosperity or adversity but i must at the very beginning lay down this principle friendship can only exist between good men i do not however press this too closely like the philosophers who push their definitions to a superfluous accuracy they have truth on their side perhaps but it is of no practical advantage those i mean who say that no one but the wise is good granted by all means but the wisdom they mean is one to which no mortal ever yet attained we must concern ourselves with the facts of everyday life as we find it not imaginary and ideal perfections even gaius fannius manius curius and tiberius caruncanius whom our ancestors decided to be wise i could never declare to be so according to their standard let them then keep this word wisdom to themselves everybody is irritated by it no one understands what it means let them but grant that the men i mentioned were good no they won't do that either no one but the wise can be allowed that title they say well then let us dismiss them and manage as best we may with our own poor mother wit as the phrase is we mean then by the good those whose actions and lives leave no question as to their honour purity equity and liberality who are free from greed lust and violence and who have the courage of their convictions the men i have just named may serve as examples such men as these being generally accounted good let us agree to call them so on the ground that to the best of human ability they follow nature as the most perfect guide to a good life now this truth seems clear to me that nature has so formed us that a certain tie unites us all but that this tie becomes stronger from proximity so it is that fellow-citizens are preferred in our affections to foreigners relations to strangers for in all their case nature herself has caused a kind of friendship to exist though it is one which lacks some of the elements of permanence friendship excels relationship in this that whereas you may eliminate affection from relationships you cannot do so from friendship without it relationship still exists in name friendship does not you may best understand this friendship by considering that whereas the merely natural ties uniting the human race are indefinite this one is so concentrated and confined to so narrow a sphere that affection is ever shared by two persons only or at most by a few six now friendship may be thus defined a complete accord on all subjects human and divine joined with mutual good will and affection 
and with the exception of wisdom i am inclined to think nothing better than this has been given to man by the immortal gods there are people who give the palm to riches or to good health or to power and office many even to sensual pleasures this last is the ideal of brute beasts and of the others we may say that they are frail and uncertain and depend less on our own prudence than on the caprice of fortune then there are those who find the chief good in virtue well that is a noble doctrine but the very virtue they talk of is the parent and preserver of friendship and without it friendship cannot possibly exist let us i repeat use the word virtue in the ordinary acceptation and meaning of the term and do not let us define it in high-flown language let us account as good the persons usually considered so such as paulus cato gallus scipio and phalus such men as these are good enough for everyday life and we need not trouble ourselves about those ideal characters which are nowhere to be met with well between men like these the advantages of friendship are almost more than i can say to begin with how can life be worth living to use the words of ennius which lacks that repose which is to be found in the mutual goodwill of a friend what can be more delightful than to have some one to whom you can say everything with the same absolute confidence as to yourself is not prosperity robbed of half its value if you have no one to share your joy on the other hand misfortunes would be hard to bear if there were not some one to feel them even more acutely than yourself in a word other objects of ambition serve for particular ends riches for use power for securing homage office for reputation pleasure for enjoyment health for freedom from pain and full use of the functions of the body but friendship embraces innumerable advantages turn which way you please you will find it at hand it is everywhere and yet never out of place never unwelcome fire and water themselves to use a common expression are not of more universal use than friendship i am not now speaking of the common or modified form of it though even that is a source of pleasure and profit but of that true and complete friendship which existed between the select few who are known to fame such friendship enhances prosperity and relieves adversity of its burden by having and sharing it seven and great and numerous as are the blessings of friendship this certainly is the sovereign one that it gives us bright hopes for the future and forbids weakness and despair in the face of a true friend a man sees as it were a second self so that where his friend is he is if his friend be rich he is not poor though he be weak his friend's strength is his and in his friend's life he enjoys a second life after his own is finished this last is perhaps the most difficult to conceive but such is the effect of the respect the loving remembrance and the regret of friends which follow us to the grave while they take the sting out of death they add a glory to the life of the survivors nay if you eliminate from nature the tie of affection there will be an end of house and city nor will so much as the cultivation of the soil be left if you don't see the virtue of friendship and harmony you may learn it by observing the effects of quarrels and feuds was any family ever so well established any state so firmly settled as to be beyond the reach of utter destruction from animosities and factions this may teach you the immense advantage of friendship they say that a certain philosopher of agrigentum in a greek poem pronounced with the authority of an oracle the doctrine that whatever in nature and the universe was unchangeable was so in virtue of the binding force of friendship whatever was changeable was so by the solvent power of discord and indeed this is a truth which everybody understands and practically attests by experience for if any marked instance of loyal friendship in confronting or sharing danger comes to light every one applauds it to the echo what cheers were there for instance all over the theatre at a passage in the new play of my friend and guest pasuvius 
where the king not knowing which of the two was orestes pylades declared himself to be orestes that he might die in his stead while the real orestes kept on asserting that it was he the audience rose en masse and clapped their hands and this was at an incident in fiction what would they have done must we suppose if it had been in real life you can easily see what a natural feeling it is when men who would not have had the resolution to act thus themselves showed how right they thought it in another i don't think i have any more to say about friendship if there is any more and i have no doubt there is much you must if you care to do so consult those who profess to discuss such manners Phineas, we would rather apply to you yet i have often consulted such persons and have heard what they had to say with a certain satisfaction but in your discourse one somehow feels that there is a different strain scavola you would have said that still more fannius if you had been present the other day in scipio's pleasure grounds when we had the discussion about the state how splendidly he stood up for justice against philus's elaborate speech Phanius, ah it was naturally easy for the justice of men to stand up for justice scavola well then what about friendship who could discourse on it more easily than the man whose chief glory is a friendship maintained with the most absolute fidelity constancy and integrity eight Laclius now you are really using force it makes no difference what kind of force you use force it is for it is neither easy nor right to refuse a wish of my sons-in-law particularly when the wish is a creditable one in itself well then it has very often occurred to me when thinking about friendship that the chief point to be considered is this is it weakness and want of means that make friendship desired i mean is its object an interchange of good offices so that each may give that in which he is strong and receive that in which he is weak or is it not rather true that although this is an advantage naturally belonging to friendship yet its original cause is quite other prior in time more noble in character and springing more directly from our nature itself the latin word for friendship amicitia is derived from that for love amor and love is certainly the prime mover in contracting mutual affection for as to material advantages it often happens that those are obtained even by men who are courted by a mere show of friendship and treated with respect from interested motives but friendship by its nature admits of no feigning no pretence as far as it goes it is both genuine and spontaneous therefore i gather that friendship springs from a natural impulse rather than a wish for help from an inclination of the heart combined with a certain instinctive feeling of love rather than from a deliberate calculation of the material advantage it is likely to confer the strength of this feeling you may notice in certain animals they show such love to their offspring for a certain period and are so beloved by them that they clearly have a share in this natural instinctive affection but of course it is more evident in the case of man first in the natural affection between children and their parents an affection which only shocking wickedness can sunder and next when the passion of love has attained to a like strength on our finding that is some one person with whose character and nature we are in full sympathy because we think that we perceive in him what i may call the beacon light of virtue for nothing inspires love nothing conciliates affection like virtue why in a certain sense we may be said to feel affection even for men we have never seen owing to their honesty and virtue who for instance fails to dwell on the memory of gaius fabricius and manius curius with some affection and warmth of feeling though he has never seen them or who but loathes tarquinius superbus spurius cassius spurius malius we have fought for empire in italy with two great generals pyrrhus and hannibal 
for the former owing to his probity we entertain no great feelings of enmity the latter owing to his cruelty our country has detested and always will detest nine now if the attraction of probity is so great that we can love it not only in those whom we have never seen but what is more actually in an enemy we need not be surprised if men's affections are roused when they fancy that they have seen virtue and goodness in those with whom a close intimacy is possible i do not deny that affection is strengthened by the actual receipt of benefits as well as by the perception of a wish to render service combined with a closer intercourse when these are added to the original impulse of the heart to which i have alluded a quite surprising warmth of feeling springs up and if any one thinks that this comes from a sense of weakness that each may have some one to help him to his particular need all i can say is that when he maintains it to be born of want and poverty he allows to friendship an origin very base and a pedigree if i may be allowed the expression far from noble if this had been the case a man's inclination to friendship would be exactly in proportion to his low opinion of his own resources whereas the truth is quite the other way for when a man's confidence in himself is greatest when he is so fortified by virtue and wisdom as to want nothing and to feel absolutely self-dependent it is then that he is most conspicuous for seeking out and keeping up friendships did africanus for example want anything of me not the least in the world neither did i of him in my case it was an admiration of his virtue in his an opinion may be which he entertained of my character that caused our affection closer intimacy added to the warmth of our feelings but though many great material advantages did ensue they were not the source from which our affection proceeded for as we are not beneficent and liberal with any view of extorting gratitude and do not regard an act of kindness as an investment but follow a natural inclination to liberality so we look on friendship as worth trying for not because we are attracted to it by the expectation of ulterior gain but in the conviction that what it has to give us is from first to last included in the feeling itself far different is the view of those who like brute beasts refer everything to sensual pleasure and no wonder men who have degraded all their powers of thought to an object so mean and contemptible can of course raise their eyes to nothing lofty to nothing grand and divine such persons indeed let us leave out of the present question and let us accept the doctrine that the sensation of love and the warmth of inclination have their origin in a spontaneous feeling which arises directly the presence of probity is indicated when once men have conceived the inclination they of course try to attach themselves to the object of it and move themselves nearer and nearer to him their aim is that they may be on the same footing and the same level in regard to affection and be more inclined to do a good service than to ask a return and that there should be this noble rivalry between them thus both truths will be established we shall get the most important material advantages from friendship and its origin from a natural impulse rather than from a sense of need will be at once more dignified and more in accordance with fact for if it were true that its material advantages cemented friendship it would be equally true that any change in them would dissolve it but nature being incapable of change it follows that genuine friendships are eternal so much for the origin of friendship but perhaps you would not care to hear any more phanius nay pray go on let us have the rest Lelius i take on myself to speak for my friend here as his senior scevola quite right therefore pray let us hear ten lilius well then my good friends listen to some conversations about friendship which very frequently pass between scipio and myself i must begin by telling you however that he used to say that the most difficult thing in the world was for a friendship to remain unimpaired to the end of life 
so many things might intervene conflicting interests differences of opinion in politics frequent changes in character owing sometimes to misfortunes sometimes to advancing years he used to illustrate these facts from the analogy of boyhood since the warmest affections between boys are often laid aside with the boyish toga and even if they did manage to keep them up to adolescence they were sometimes broken by a rivalry in courtship or for some other advantage to which their mutual claims were not compatible even if the friendship was prolonged beyond that time yet it frequently received a rude shock should the two happen to be competitors for office for while the most fatal blow to friendship in the majority of cases was the lust of gold in the case of the best men it was a rivalry for office and reputation by which it had often happened that the most violent enmity had arisen between the closest friends again wide breaches and for the most part justifiable ones were caused by an immoral request being made of friends to pander to a man's unholy desires or to assist him in inflicting a wrong a refusal though perfectly right is attacked by those to whom they refuse compliance as a violation of the laws of friendship now the people who have no scruples as to the requests they make to their friends thereby allow that they are ready to have no scruples as to what they will do for their friends and it is the recriminations of such people which commonly not only quench friendships but give rise to lasting enmities in fact he used to say these fatalities overhang friendship in such numbers that it requires not only wisdom but good luck also to escape them all eleven with these premises then let us first if you please examine the question how far ought personal feelings to go in friendship for instance suppose coriolanus to have had friends ought they to have joined him in invading his country again in the case of vesalinus or spurius malius ought their friends to have assisted them in their attempt to establish a tyranny take two instances of either line of conduct when tiberius gracchus attempted his revolutionary measures he was deserted as we saw by quintus tubero and the friends of his own standing on the other hand a friend of your own family scaevola gens bosleus of cumae took a different course i was acting as assessor to the consuls lenus and repilius to try the conspirators and blosius pleaded for my pardon on the ground that his regard for tiberius gracchus had been so high that he looked upon his wishes as law even if he had wished you to set fire to the capital said i that is a thing he replied that he never would have wished ah but if he had wished it said i i would have obeyed the wickedness of such a speech needs no comment and in point of fact he was as good and better than his word for he did not wait for orders in the audacious proceedings of tiberius gracchus but was the head and front of them and was a leader rather than an abettor of his madness the result of his infatuation was that he fled to asia terrified by the special commission appointed to try him joined the enemies of his country and paid a penalty to the republic as heavy as it was deserved i conclude then that the plea of having acted in the interests of a friend is not a valid excuse for a wrong action for seeing that a belief in a man's virtue is the original cause of friendship friendship can hardly remain if virtue be abandoned but if we decide it to be right to grant our friends whatever they wish and to ask them for whatever we wish perfect wisdom must be assumed on both sides if no mischief is to happen but we cannot assume this perfect wisdom for we are speaking only of such friends as are ordinarily to be met with whether we have actually seen them or have been told about them men that is to say of everyday life i must quote some examples of such persons taking care to select such as approach nearest to our standard of wisdom we read for example that pappus aemilius was a close friend of gaius licinius history tells us that they were twice consuls together and colleagues in the censorship again it is on record that manius curius and tiberius corincanius were on the most intimate terms with them and with each other 
now we cannot even suspect that any one of these men ever asked of his friend anything that militated against his honor or his oath or the interests of the republic in the case of such men as these there is no point in saying that one of them would not have obtained such a request if he had made it for they were men of the most scrupulous piety and the making of such a request would involve a breach of religious obligation no less than the granting it however it is quite true that gaius carbo and gaius cato did follow tiberius gracchus and though his brother caius gracchus did not do so at the time he is now the most eager of them all twelve we may then lay down this rule of friendship neither ask nor consent to do what is wrong for the plea of friendship's sake is a discreditable one and not to be admitted for a moment this rule holds good for all wrongdoing but more especially in such as involves disloyalty to the republic for things have come to such a point with us my dear fannius and scevola that we are bound to look somewhat far ahead to what is likely to happen to the republic the constitution as known to our ancestors has already swerved somewhat from the regular course and the lines marked out for it tiberius gracchus made an attempt to obtain the power of a king or i might rather say enjoyed that power for a few months had the roman people ever heard or seen the like before what the friends and connections that followed him even after his death have succeeded in doing in the case of publius scipio i cannot describe without tears as for carbo thanks to the punishment recently inflicted on tiberius gracchus we have by hook or by crook managed to hold out against his attacks but what to expect of the tribuneship of caius gracchus i do not like to forecast one thing leads to another and once set going the downward course proceeds with ever-increasing velocity there is the case of the ballot what a blow was inflicted first by the lex gabinia and two years afterwards by the lex cassia i seem already to see the people estranged from the senate and the most important affairs at the mercy of the multitude for you may be sure that more people will learn how to set such things in motion than how to stop them what is the point of these remarks this no one ever makes any attempt of this sort without friends to help him we must therefore impress upon good men that should they become inevitably involved in friendships with men of this kind they ought not to consider themselves under any obligation to stand by friends who are disloyal to the republic bad men must have the fear of punishment before their eyes a punishment not less severe for those who follow than for those who lead others to crime who is more famous and powerful in greece than themistocles at the head of the army in the persian war he had freed greece he owed his exile to personal envy but he did not submit to the wrong done him by his ungrateful country as he ought to have done he acted as coriolanus had acted among us twenty years before but no one was found to help them in their attacks upon their fatherland both of them accordingly committed suicide we conclude then not only that no such confederation of evilly disposed men must be allowed to shelter itself under the plea of friendship but that on the contrary it must be visited with the severest punishment lest the idea should prevail that fidelity to a friend justifies even making war upon one's country and this is a case which i am inclined to think considering how things are beginning to go will sooner or later arise and i care quite as much what the state of the constitution will be after my death as what it is now thirteen let this then be laid down as the first law of friendship that we should ask from friends and do for friends only what is good but do not let us wait to be asked either let there be ever an eager readiness and an absence of hesitation let us have the courage to give advice with candor in friendship let the influence of friends who give good advice be paramount and let this influence be used to enforce advice 
not only in plain spoken terms but sometimes if the case demands it with sharpness and when so used let it be obeyed i give you these rules because i believe that some wonderful opinions are entertained by certain persons who have i am told a reputation for wisdom in greece there is nothing in the world by the way beyond the reach of their sophistry well some of them teach that we should avoid very close friendships for fear that one man should have to endure the anxieties of several each man they say has enough and to spare on his own hands it is too bad to be involved in the cares of other people the wisest course is to hold the reins of friendship as loose as possible you can then tighten or slacken them at your will for the first condition of a happy life is freedom from care which no man's mind can enjoy if it has to travail so to speak for others besides himself another sect i am told gives vent to opinions still less generous i briefly touched on this subject just now they affirm that friendships should be sought solely for the sake of the assistance they give and not at all from motives of feeling and affection and that therefore just in proportion as a man's power and means of support are lowest he is most eager to gain friendships thence it comes that weak women seek the support of friendship more than men the poor more than the rich the unfortunate rather than those esteemed prosperous what noble philosophy you might as well take the sun out of the sky as friendship from life for the immortal gods have given us nothing better or more delightful but let us examine the two doctrines what is the value of this freedom from care it is very tempting at first sight but in practice it has in many cases to be put on one side for there is no business and no course of action demanded from us by our honour which you can consistently decline or lay aside when begun from a mere wish to escape from anxiety nay if we wish to avoid anxiety we must avoid virtue itself which necessarily involves some anxious thoughts in showing its loathing and abhorrence for the qualities which are opposite to itself as kindness for ill-nature self-control for licentiousness courage for cowardice thus you may notice that it is the just who are most pained at injustice the brave at cowardly actions the temperate at depravity it is then a characteristic of a rightly ordered mind to be pleased at what is good and grieved at the reverse seeing then that the wise are not exempt from the heartache which must be the case unless we suppose all human nature rooted out of their hearts why should we banish friendship from our lives for fear of being involved by it in some amount of distress if you take away emotion what difference remains i don't say between a man and a beast but between a man and a stone or a log of wood or anything else of that kind neither should we give any weight to the doctrine that virtue is something rigid and unyielding as iron in point of fact it is in regard to friendship as in so many other things so supple and sensitive that it expands so to speak at a friend's good fortune contracts at his misfortunes we conclude then that mental pain which we must often encounter on a friend's account is not of sufficient consequence to banish friendship from our life any more than it is true that the cardinal virtues are to be dispensed with because they involve certain anxieties and distresses end of treatise one part one Treatise One of On Friendship and On Old Age by Marcus Tullius Cicero. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Treatise One On Friendship, Part Two. Fourteen. Let me repeat then the clear indication of virtue to which a mind of like character is naturally attracted is the beginning of friendship. When that is the case, the rise of affection is a necessity 
for what can be more irrational than to take delight in many objects incapable of response such as office fame splendid buildings and personal decoration and yet to take little or none in a sentient being endowed with virtue which has the faculty of loving or if i may use the expression loving back for nothing is really more delightful than a return of affection and the mutual interchange of kind feelings and good offices and if we add as we may fairly do that nothing so powerfully attracts and draws one thing to itself as likeness does to friendship it will at once be admitted to be true that the good love the good and attach them to themselves as though they were united by blood and nature for nothing can be more eager or rather greedy for what is like itself than nature so my dear fannius and scibola we may look upon this as an established fact that between good men there is as it were of necessity a kindly feeling which is the source of friendship ordained by nature but this same kindliness affects the many also for that is no unsympathetic or selfish or exclusive virtue which protects even whole nations and consults their best interests and that certainly it would not have done had it disdained all affection for the common herd again the believers in the interest theory appear to me to destroy the most attractive link in the chain of friendship for it is not so much what one gets by a friend that gives one pleasure as the warmth of his feeling and we only care for a friend's service if it has been prompted by affection and so far from its being true that lack of means is a motive for seeking friendship it is usually those who being most richly endowed with wealth and means and above all with virtue which after all is a man's best support are least in need of another that are most open-handed and beneficent indeed i am inclined to think that friends ought at times to be in want of something for instance what scope would my affections have had if scipio had never wanted my advice or cooperation at home or abroad it is not friendship then that follows material advantage but material advantage friendship fifteen we must not therefore listen to these superfine gentlemen when they talk of friendship which they know neither in theory nor in practice for who in heaven's name would choose a life of the greatest wealth and abundance on condition of neither loving or being loved by any creature that is the sort of life tyrants endure they of course can count on no fidelity no affection no security for the good will of any one for them all is suspicion and anxiety for them there is no possibility of friendship who can love one whom he fears or by whom he knows that he is feared yet such men have a show of friendship offered them but it is only a fair-weather show if it ever happens that they fall as it generally does they will at once understand how friendless they are so they say tarquin observed in his exile that he never knew which of his friends were real and which sham until he had ceased to be able to repay either though what surprises me is that a man of his proud and overbearing character should have a friend at all and as it was his character that prevented his having genuine friends so it often happens in the case of men of unusually great means their very wealth forbids faithful friendship for not only is fortune blind herself but she generally makes those blind also who enjoy her favours they are carried so to speak beyond themselves with self-conceit and self-will nor can anything be more perfectly intolerable than a successful fool you may often see it men who before had pleasant manners enough undergo a complete change on attaining power of office they despise their old friends devote themselves to new now can anything be more foolish than that men who have all the opportunities which prosperity wealth and great means can bestow should secure all else which money can buy horses servants splendid upholstering and costly plate but do not secure friends who are if i may use the expression the most valuable and beautiful furniture of life and yet when they acquire the former they know not who will enjoy them nor for whom they may be taking all this trouble for they will one and all eventually belong to the strongest while each man has a stable and inalienable ownership in his friendships 
and even if those possessions which are in a manner the gifts of fortune do prove permanent life can never be anything but joyless which is without the consolations and companionship of friends sixteen to turn to another branch of our subject we must now endeavour to ascertain what limits are to be observed in friendship what is the boundary line so to speak beyond which our affection is not to go on this point i notice three opinions with none of which i agree one is that we should love our friend just as much as we love ourselves and no more another that our affection to them should exactly correspond and equal theirs to us a third that a man should be valued at exactly the same rate as he values himself to not one of these opinions do i assent the first which holds that our regard for ourselves is to be the measure of our regard for our friend is not true for how many things there are which we would never have done for our own sakes but do for the sake of a friend we submit to make requests from unworthy people to descend even to supplication to be sharper in invective more violent in attack such actions are not creditable in our own interests but highly so in those of our friends there are many advantages too which men of upright character voluntarily forego or of which they are content to be deprived that their friends may enjoy them rather than themselves the second doctrine is that which limits friendship to an exact equality in mutual good offices and good feelings but such a view reduces friendship to a question of figures in a spirit far too narrow and illiberal as though the object were to have an exact balance in a debtor and creditor account true friendship appears to me to be something richer and more generous than that comes to and not to be so narrowly on its guard against giving more than it receives in such a matter we must not be always afraid of something being wasted or running over in our measure or of more than is justly due being devoted to our friendship but the last limit proposed is the worst namely that a friend's estimate of himself is to be the measure of our estimate of him it often happens that a man has too humble an idea of himself or takes too despairing a view of his chance of bettering his fortune in such a case a friend ought not to take the view of him which he takes of himself rather he should do all he can to raise his drooping spirits and lead him to more cheerful hopes and thoughts we must then find some other limit but i must first mention the sentiment which used to call forth scipio's severest criticism he often said that no one ever gave utterance to anything more diametrically opposed to the spirit of friendship than the author of the dictum you should love your friend with the consciousness that you may one day hate him he could not be induced to believe that it was rightfully attributed to bias who was counted as one of the seven sages it was the sentiment of some person with sinister motives or selfish ambition or who regarded everything as it affected his own supremacy how can a man be friends with another if he thinks it possible that he may be his enemy why it will follow that he must wish and desire his friend to commit as many mistakes as possible that he may have all the more handles against him and conversely that he must be annoyed irritated and jealous at the right actions or good fortune of his friends this maxim then let it be whose it will is the utter destruction of friendship the true rule is to take such care in the selection of our friends as never to enter upon a friendship with a man whom we could under any circumstances come to hate and even if we are unlucky in our choice we must put up with it according to scipio in preference to making calculations as to future breach seventeen the real limit to be observed in friendship is this the characters of two friends must be stainless there must be complete harmony of interests purpose and aims without exception then if the case arises of a friend's wish not strictly right in itself calling for support in a matter involving his life or reputation we must make some concession from the straight path 
on condition that is to say that extreme disgrace is not the consequence something must be conceded to friendship and yet we must not be entirely careless of our reputation nor regard the good opinion of our fellow-citizens as a weapon which we can afford to despise in conducting the business of our life however lowering it may be to tout for it by flattery and smooth words we must by no means abjure virtue which secures us affection but to return again to scipio the sole author of the discourse on friendship he used to complain that there was nothing on which men bestowed so little pains that every one could tell exactly how many goats or sheep he had but not how many friends and while they took pains in procuring the former they were utterly careless in selecting friends and possessed no particular marks so to speak or tokens by which they might judge of their suitability for friendship now the qualities we ought to look for in making our selection are firmness stability constancy there is a plentiful lack of men so endowed and it is difficult to form a judgment without testing now this testing can only be made during the actual existence of the friendship for friendship so often precedes the formation of a judgment and makes a previous test impossible if we are prudent then we shall rein in our impulse to affection as we do chariot horses we make a preliminary trial of horses so we should a friendship and should test our friends characters by a kind of tentative friendship it may often happen that the untrustworthiness of certain men is completely displayed in a small money matter others who are proof against a small sum are detected if it be large but even if some are found who think it mean to prefer money to friendship where shall we look for those who put friendship before office civil or military promotions and political power and who when the choice lies between these things on the one side and the claims of friendship on the other do not give a strong preference to the former it is not in human nature to be indifferent to political power and if the price men have to pay for it is the sacrifice of friendship they think their treason will be thrown into the shade by the magnitude of the reward this is why true friendship is very difficult to find among those who engage in politics and the contest for office where can you find the man to prefer his friend's advancement to his own and to say nothing of that think how grievous and almost intolerable it is to most men to share political disaster you will scarcely find any one who can bring himself to do that and though what ennius says is quite true the hour of need shows the friend indeed yet it is in these two ways that most people betray their untrustworthiness and inconstancy by looking down on friends when they are themselves prosperous or deserting them in their distress a man then who has shown a firm unshaken and unvarying friendship in both these contingencies we must reckon as one of a class the rarest in the world and all but superhuman eighteen now what is the quality to look out for as a warrant for the stability and permanence of friendship it is loyalty nothing that lacks this can be stable we should also in making our selection look out for simplicity a social disposition and a sympathetic nature moved by what moves us these all contribute to maintain loyalty you can never trust a character which is intricate and tortuous nor indeed is it possible for one to be trustworthy and firm who is unsympathetic by nature and unmoved by what affects ourselves we may add that he must neither take pleasure in bringing accusations against us himself nor believe them when they are brought all these contribute to form that constancy which i have been endeavouring to describe and the result is what i started by saying that friendship is only possible between good men now there are two characteristic features in his treatment of his friends that a good which may be regarded as equivalent to a wise man will always display first he will be entirely without any make-believe or pretence of feeling for the open display even of dislike is more becoming to an ingenuous character than a studied concealment of sentiment secondly he will not only reject all accusations brought against his friend by another but he will not be suspicious himself either nor be always thinking that his friend has acted improperly 
besides this there should be a certain pleasantness in word and manner which adds no little flavor to friendship a gloomy temper and unvarying gravity may be very impressive but friendship should be a little less unbending more indulgent and gracious and more inclined to all kinds of good fellowship and good nature nineteen but here arises a question of some little difficulty are there any occasions on which assuming their worthiness we should prefer new to old friends just as we prefer young to aged horses the answer admits of no doubt whatever for there should be no satiety in friendship as there is in other things the older the sweeter as in wines that keep well and the proverb is a true one you must eat many a peck of salt with a man to be thorough friends with him novelty indeed has its advantage which we must not despise there is always hope of fruit as there is in healthy blades of corn but age too must have its proper position and in fact the influence of time and habit is very great to recur to the illustration of the horse which i have just now used every one likes surgeries paribus to use the horse to which he has been accustomed rather than one that is untried and new and it is not only in the case of a living thing that this rule holds good but in inanimate things also for we like places where we have lived the longest even though they are mountainous and covered with forest but here is another golden rule in friendship put yourself on a level with your friend for it often happens that there are certain superiorities as for example scipios and what i may call our set now he never assumed any airs of superiority over philus or rupilius or mumius or over friends of a lower rank still for instance he always showed a preference to his brother quintus maximus because he was his senior who though a man no doubt of eminent character was by no means his equal he used also to wish that all his friends should be the better for his support this is an example we should all follow if any of us have any advantage in personal character intellect or fortune we should be ready to make our friends sharers and partners in it with ourselves for instance if their parents are in humble circumstances if their relations are powerful neither in intellect nor means we should supply their deficiencies and promote their rank and dignity you know the legends of children brought up as servants in ignorance of their parentage and family when they are recognized and discovered to be the sons of gods or kings they still retain their affection for the shepherds whom they have for many years looked upon as their parents much more ought this to be so in the case of real and undoubted parents for the advantages of genius and virtue and in short of every kind of superiority are never realized to their fullest extent until they are bestowed upon our nearest and dearest twenty but the converse must also be observed for in friendship and relationship just as those who possess any superiority must put themselves on an equal footing with those who are less fortunate so these latter must not be annoyed at being surpassed in genius fortune or rank but most people of that sort are forever either grumbling at something or harping on their claims and especially if they consider that they have services of their own to allege involving zeal and friendship and some trouble to themselves people who are always bringing up their services are a nuisance the recipient ought to remember them the performer should never mention them in the case of friends then as the superior are bound to descend so are they bound in a certain sense to raise those below them for there are people who make their friendship disagreeable by imagining themselves undervalued this generally happens only to those who think that they deserve to be so and they ought to be shown by deeds as well as by words the groundlessness of their opinion now the measure of your benefits should be in the first place your own power to bestow and in the second place the capacity to bear them on the part of him on whom you are bestowing affection and help for however great your personal prestige may be you cannot raise all your friends to the highest offices of the state for instance scipio was able to make publius rupilius consul but not his brother lucius but granting that you can give any one anything you choose you must have a care that it does not prove to be beyond his powers 
as a general rule we must wait to make up our mind about friendships till men's characters and years have arrived at their full strength and development people must not for instance regard as fast friends all whom in their youth enthusiasm for hunting or football they liked for having the same tastes by that rule if it were a mere question of time no one would have such claims on our affections as nurses and slave tutors not that they are to be neglected but they stand on a different ground it is only these mature friendships that can be permanent for difference of character leads to difference of aims and the result of such diversity is to estrange friends the sole reason for instance which prevents good men from making friends with bad or bad with good is that the divergence of their characters and aims is the greatest possible another good rule in friendship is this do not let an excessive affection hinder the highest interests of your friends this very often happens i will go again to the region of fable for an instance neoptolemus could never have taken troy if he had been willing to listen to lycomedes who had brought him up and with many tears tried to prevent his going there again it often happens that important business makes it necessary to part from friends the man who tries to balk it because he thinks that he cannot endure the separation is of a weak and effeminate nature and on that very account makes but a poor friend there are of course limits to what you ought to expect from a friend and to what you should allow him to demand of you and these you must take into calculation in every case twenty one again there is such a disaster so to speak as having to break off friendship and sometimes it is one we cannot avoid for at this point the stream of our discourse is leaving the intimacies of the wise and touching on the friendship of ordinary people it will happen at times that an outbreak of vicious conduct affects either a man's friends themselves or strangers yet the discredit falls on the friends in such cases friendship should be allowed to die out gradually by an intermission of intercourse they should as i have been told that cato used to say rather be unstitched than torn in twain unless indeed the injurious conduct be of so violent and outrageous a nature as to make an instant breach and separation the only possible course consistent with honour and rectitude again if a change in character and aim takes place as often happens or if party politics produces an alienation of feeling i am now speaking as i said a short time ago of ordinary friendships not of those of the wise we shall have to be on our guard against appearing to embark upon active enmity while we only mean to resign a friendship for there can be nothing more discreditable than to be at open war with a man with whom you have been intimate scipio as you are aware had abandoned his friendship for quintus pompeius on my account and again from differences of opinion in politics he became estranged from my colleague metellus in both cases he acted with dignity and moderation showing that he was offended indeed but without rancour our first object then should be to prevent a breach our second to secure that if it does occur our friendship should seem to have died a natural rather than a violent death next we should take care that friendship is not converted into active hostility from which flow personal quarrels abusive language and angry recriminations these last however provided that they do not pass all reasonable limits of forbearance we ought to put up with and in a compliment to an old friendship allow the party that inflicts the injury not the one that submits to it to be in the wrong generally speaking there is but one way of securing and providing oneself against faults and inconveniences of this sort not to be too hasty in bestowing our affection and not to bestow it at all on unworthy objects now by worthy of friendship i mean those who have in themselves the qualities which attract affection this sort of man is rare and indeed all excellent things are rare and nothing in the world is so hard to find as a thing entirely and completely perfect of its kind 
but most people not only recognize nothing as good in our life unless it is profitable but look upon friends as so much stock caring most for those by whom they hope to make most profit accordingly they never possess that most beautiful and most spontaneous friendship which must be sought solely for itself without any ulterior object they fail also to learn from their own feelings the nature and the strength of friendship for every one loves himself not for any reward which such love may bring but because he is dear to himself independently of anything else but unless this feeling is transferred to another what a real friend is will never be revealed for he is as it were a second self but if we find these two instincts showing themselves in animals whether of the air or of the sea or the land whether wild or tame first a love of self which in fact is born in everything that lives alike and secondly an eagerness to find and attach themselves to other creatures of their own kind and if this natural action is accompanied by desire and by something resembling human love how much more must this be the case in man by the law of his nature for man not only loves himself but seeks another whose spirit he may so blend with his own as almost to make one being of two twenty two but most people unreasonably not to speak of modesty want such a friend as they are unable to be themselves and expect from their friends what they do not themselves give the fair course is first to be good yourself and then to look out for another of like character it is between such that the stability and friendship of which we have been talking can be secured when that is to say men who are united by affection learn first of all to rule those passions which enslave others and in the next place to take delight in fair and equitable conduct to bear each other's burdens never to ask each other for anything inconsistent with virtue and rectitude and not only to serve and love but also to respect each other i say respect for if respect is gone friendship has lost its brightest jewel and this shows the mistake of those who imagine that friendship gives a privilege to licentiousness and sin nature has given us friendship as the handmaid of virtue not as a partner in guilt to the end that virtue being powerless when isolated to reach the highest objects might succeed in doing so in union and partnership with another those who enjoy in the present or have enjoyed in the past or are destined to enjoy in the future such a partnership as this must be considered to have secured the most excellent and auspicious combination for reaching nature's highest good this is the partnership i say which combines moral rectitude fame peace of mind serenity all that men think desirable because with them life is happy but without them cannot be so this being our best and highest object we must if we desire to attain it devote ourselves to virtue for without virtue we can obtain neither friendship nor anything else desirable in fact if virtue be neglected those who imagine themselves to possess friends will find out their error as soon as some grave disaster forces them to make trial of them wherefore i must again and again repeat you must satisfy your judgment before engaging your affections not love first and judge afterwards we suffer from carelessness in many of our undertakings in none more than in selecting and cultivating our friends we put the cart before the horse and shut the stable door when the steed is stolen in defiance of the old proverb for having mutually involved ourselves in a long-standing intimacy or by actual obligations all on a sudden some cause of offence arises and we break off our friendships in full career twenty three it is this that makes such carelessness in a matter of supreme importance all the more worthy of blame i say supreme importance because friendship is the one thing about the utility of which everybody with one accord is agreed that is not the case in regard even to virtue itself for many people speak slightingly of virtue as though it were mere puffing and self-glorification nor is it the case with riches 
many look down on riches being content with a little and taking pleasure in poor fare and dress and as to the political offices for which some have a burning desire how many entertain such a contempt for them as to think nothing in the world more empty and trivial and so on with the rest things desirable in the eyes of some are regarded by very many as worthless but of friendship all think alike to a man whether those have devoted themselves to politics or those who delight in science and philosophy or those who follow a private way of life and care for nothing but their own business or those lastly who have given themselves body and soul to sensuality they all think i say that without friendship life is no life if they want some part of it at any rate to be noble for friendship in one way or another penetrates into the lives of us all and suffers no career to be entirely free from its influence though a man be of so churlish and unsociable a nature as to loathe and shun the company of mankind as it were told was the case with a certain timon at athens yet even he cannot refrain from seeking some one in whose hearing he may disgorge the venom of his bitter temper we should see this most clearly if it were possible that some god should carry us away from these haunts of men and place us somewhere in perfect solitude and then should supply us in abundance with everything necessary to our nature and yet take from us entirely the opportunity of looking upon a human being who could steel himself to endure such a life who could not lose in his loneliness the zest for all pleasures and indeed this is the point of the observation of i think archytas of tarentum i have it third hand men who were my seniors told me that their seniors had told them it was this if a man could ascend to heaven and get a clear view of the natural order of the universe and the beauty of the heavenly bodies that wonderful spectacle would give him small pleasure though nothing could be conceived more delightful if he had but had some one to whom to tell what he had seen so true it is that nature abhors isolation and never leans upon something as a stay and support and this is found in its most pleasing form in our closest friend twenty four but though nature also declares by so many indications what her wish and object and desire is we yet in a manner turn a deaf ear and will not hear her warnings the intercourse between friends is varied and complex and it must often happen that causes of suspicion and offence arise which a wise man will sometimes avoid at other times remove at others treat with indulgence the one possible cause of offence that must be faced is when the interests of your friend and your own sincerity are at stake for instance it often happens that friends need remonstrance and even reproof when these are administered in a kindly spirit they ought to be taken in good part but somehow or other there is truth in what my friend terence says in his andrea compliance gets us friends plain speaking hate plain speaking is a cause of trouble if the result of it is resentment which is poison of friendship but compliance is really the cause of much more trouble because by indulging his faults it lets a friend plunge into headlong ruin but the man who is most to blame is he who resents plain speaking and allows flattery to egg him on to his ruin on this point then from first to last there is need of deliberation and care if we remonstrate it should be without bitterness if we reprove there should be no word of insult in the matter of compliance for i am glad to adopt terence's word though there should be every courtesy yet that base kind which assists a man in vice should be far from us for it is unworthy of a free-born man to say nothing of a friend it is one thing to live with a tyrant another with a friend but if a man's ears are so closed to plain speaking that he cannot hear to hear the truth from a friend we may give him up in despair this remark of cato's as so many of his did shows great acuteness there are people who owe more to bitter enemies than to apparently pleasant friends the former often speak the truth the latter never 
besides it is a strange paradox that the recipient of advice should feel no annoyance where they ought to feel it and yet feel so much where they ought not they are not at all vexed at having committed a fault but very angry at being reproved for it on the contrary they ought to be grieved at the crime and glad of the correction twenty five well then if it is true that to give and receive advice the former with freedom and yet without bitterness the latter with patience and without irritation is peculiarly appropriate to genuine friendship it is no less true that there can be nothing more utterly subversive of friendship than flattery adulation and base compliance i use as many terms as possible to brand this vice of light-minded untrustworthy men whose sole object in speaking is to please without any regard to truth in everything false pretense is bad for it suspends and vitiates our power of discerning the truth but to nothing it is so hostile as to friendship for it destroys that frankness without which friendship is an empty name for the essence of friendship being that two minds become as one how can that ever take place if the mind of each of the separate parties to it is not single and uniform but variable changeable and complex can anything be so pliable so wavering as the mind of a man whose attitude depends not only on another's feeling and wish but on his very looks and nods if one says no i answer no if yes i answer yes in fine i've laid this task upon myself to echo all that said to quote my old friend terence again but he puts these words into the mouth of anatho to admit such a man into one's intimacy at all is a sign of folly but there are many people like natho and it is when they are superior either in position or fortune or reputation that their flatteries become mischievous the weight of their position making up for the lightness of their character but if we only take reasonable care it is easy to separate and distinguish a genuine from a specious friend as anything else that is coloured and artificial from what is sincere and genuine a public assembly though composed of men of the smallest possible culture nevertheless will see clearly the difference between a mere demagogue that is a flatterer and untrustworthy citizen and a man of principle standing and solidity it was by this kind of flattering language that gaius papirius the other day endeavoured to tickle the ears of the assembled people when proposing his law to make the tribunes re-eligible i spoke against it but i will leave the personal question i prefer speaking of scipio good heavens how impressive his speech was what a majesty there was in it you would have pronounced him without hesitation to be no mere henchman of the roman people but their leader however you were there and moreover have the speech in your hands the result was that a law meant to please the people was by the people's votes rejected once more to refer to myself you remember how apparently popular was the law proposed by gaius licinius crassus about the election to the college of priests in the consulship of quintus maximus scipio's brother and lucius mancinus for the power of filling up their own vacancies on the part of the colleges was by this proposal to be transferred to the people it was this man by the way who began the practice of turning towards the forum when addressing the people in spite of this however upon my speaking on the conservative side religion gained an easy victory over his plausible speech this took place in my praetorship five years before i was elected consul which shows that the cause was successfully maintained more by the merits of the case than by the prestige of the highest office twenty six now if on a stage such as a public assembly essentially is where there is the amplest room for fiction and half-truths truth nevertheless prevails if it be but fairly laid open and brought into the light of day what ought to happen in the case of friendship which rests entirely on truthfulness friendship in which unless you both see and show an open breast to use a common expression you can neither trust nor be certain of anything no not even of mutual affection since you cannot be sure of its sincerity 
however this flattery injurious as it is can hurt no one but the man who takes it in and likes it and it follows that the man to open his ears widest to flatterers is he who first flatters himself and is fondest of himself i grant you that virtue naturally loves herself for she knows herself and perceives how worthy of love she is but i am not now speaking of absolute virtue but of the belief men have that they possess virtue the fact is that fewer people are endowed with virtue than wish to be thought to be so it is such people that take delight in flattery when they are addressed in language expressly adapted to flatter their vanity they look upon such empty persiflage as a testimony to the truth of their own praises it is not then properly friendship at all when the one will not listen to the truth and the other is prepared to lie nor would the servility of parasites in comedy have seemed humorous to us had there been no such things as braggart captains is thais really much obliged to me it would have been quite enough to answer much but he must say immensely your servile flatterer always exaggerates what his victim wishes to be put strongly wherefore though it is with those who catch at and invite it that this flattering falsehood is especially powerful yet men even of solider and steadier character must be warned to be on the watch against being taken in by cunningly disguised flattery an open flatterer any one can detect unless he is an absolute fool the covered insinuation of the cunning and the sly is what we have to be studiously on our guard against his detection is not by any means the easiest thing in the world, for he often covers his servility under the guise of contradiction, and flatters by pretending to dispute, and then at last giving in and allowing himself to be beaten, that the person hoodwinked may think himself to have been the clearer sighted. Now what can be more degrading than to be thus hoodwinked? you must be on your guard against this happening to you like the man in the arras how have i been befooled no drivelling dotards on any stage were e'er so played upon for even on the stage we have no grosser representation of folly than that of short-sighted and credulous old men but somehow or other i have strayed away from the friendship of the perfect that is of the wise meaning of course such wisdom as human nature is capable of to the subject of vulgar unsubstantial friendships let us then return to our original theme and at length bring that too to a conclusion twenty seven well then fannius and lucius i repeat what i said before it is a virtue virtue which both creates and preserves friendship on it depends harmony of interest permanence fidelity when virtue has reared her head and shown the light of her countenance and seen and recognized the same light in another she gravitates towards it and in her turn welcomes that which the other has to show and from it springs up a flame which you may call love or friendship as you please both words are from the same root in latin and love is just the cleaving to him whom you love without the prompting of need or any view to advantage though this latter blossoms spontaneously on friendship little as you may have looked for it it is with such warmth of feeling that i cherished lucius paulus marcus cato gallus gallus publius nasica tiberius gracchus my dear scipio's father-in-law it shines with even greater warmth when men are of the same age as in the case of scipio and lucius furius publius rapilius spurius mummius and myself en revanche in my old age i find comfort in the affection of young men as in the case of yourselves and quintus tubero nay more i delight in the intimacy of such a very young man as publius rutilius and aulus virginius and since the law of our nature and of our life is that a new generation is forever springing up the most desirable thing is that along with your contemporaries with whom you started in the race you may also teach what is to us the goal but in view of the instability and perishableness of mortal things we should be continually on the lookout for some to love 
and by whom to be loved for if we lose affection and kindliness from our life we lose all that gives it charm for me indeed though torn away by a sudden stroke scipio still lives and ever will live for it was the virtue of the man that i loved and that has not suffered death and it is not my eyes only because i had all my life a personal experience of it that never lose sight of it it will shine to posterity also with undimmed glory no one will ever cherish a nobler ambition or a loftier hope without thinking his memory and his image the best to put before his eyes i declare that of all the blessings which either fortune or nature has bestowed upon me i know none to compare with scipio's friendship in it i found sympathy in public counsel in private business in it too a means of spending my leisure with unalloyed delight never to the best of my knowledge did i offend him even in the most trivial point never did i hear a word from him i could have wished unsaid we had one house one table one style of living and not only were we together on foreign service but in our tours also and country sojourns why speak of our eagerness to be ever gaining some knowledge to be ever learning something on which we spent all our leisure hours far from the gaze of the world if the recollection and memory of these things had perished with the man i could not possibly have endured the regret for one so closely united with me in life and affection but these things have not perished they are rather fed and strengthened by reflection and memory even supposing me to have been entirely bereft of them still my time of life of itself brings me no small consolation for i cannot have much longer now to bear this regret and everything that is brief ought to be endurable however severe this is all i had to say on friendship one piece of advice on parting make up your minds to this virtue without which friendship is impossible is first but next to it and to it alone the greatest of all things is friendship end of treatise one part two